Hello, friends, and welcome to this episode of Filling the Experience Gap. Today's guest is Andre Angelkovsky, who's a realtor friend of mine who I've known for something like 15 years or so. We used to work together. Anyway, welcome, Andre, and thanks for joining us. Hey, Greg, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you. So why don't you give us a little background information? What's your name, uh, your position, the company, and the industry you're in? All right. So I'm Andre Angelkowski. I'm in the real estate industry as a real estate agent, and I work with Remax Ultimate in the city of Toronto. Cool. And what's your uh, your your target area that you work in? Uh, I my target area is the Toronto Beaches, Leslieville, Danforth area. Okay. That's the area I, I really enjoy working in. I. Uh, I Probably 50% of my business at least is in that area. And the rest of the 50% is, uh, you know, throughout the GTA. Okay, interesting. How is it that you find yourself in the real estate industry? Well, uh, when I was working for you in Love Laws, um, I was, so out of university um, in 2002, my cousin sat me down and said to me, Andre, now that you've graduated, I want to introduce you to a book that can, that has influenced him. So he thought it would be a good idea to pass it on to me. And that was The Wealthy Barber. Mm-hmm. So after reading that, I learned about how to save money and how to invest money. And then I got introduced to another book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that sort of changed my mindset on, on the sort of the interest or the value of real estate and what that can do for you. So once I got introduced to those, I started reading more books, started meeting different people, and actually started investing in real estate myself. So once I started doing that, I was like, okay, I think I've figured out where I want to be. Um, but the, one of the bigger, bigger reasons why I became a real estate agent is because when I was investing in real estate, I went through several different agents that really... I would categorize them as generalists. Mm. They weren't specialists focused on a niche uh, sort of category, such as real estate investing. So I had a really hard time finding someone that could help me invest in the best real estate possible. So, you know, after investing a few properties myself, I thought, you know what, what better way to help myself and, 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 and beyond that is help others invest in real estate is is become an agent myself. So that's how I got into the industry. Cool. Cool. And how how many years has it been? Was I right? Around 15? Uh, Yeah. Yep. That's right. Wow. I'm sure you've (laughs) seen a lot in 15 years with uh, up markets, down markets, and everything in between. That, 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 yes. uh, But more so when you start interacting with individuals, you start to see different personalities you start to see different needs different criteria different houses different properties of all kinds of conditions you go through different experiences different transactions issues learning experiences tons of lessons like you know the ups and downs of the market is is not even like part of my i'd say top 50 list of 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 experiences it's it's more of the day-to-day interactions and how they come together and help you be a better person to guide the next person that you're, that you're serving. Cool. And it's interesting how, because on the outside looking in, there's a tendency, I think, to think that the market is 80% of the equation. Like you just said, for you, it's, it's actually a much smaller part of the equation. That's interesting. People normally think that 80% of the of the equation is the real estate market. Yeah. I'd say 80% of the conversations out there are about the market and how the ups and downs are going through the ebbs and flows. But what it really comes down to is, is the other 20%. Uh, so people always talk about the market and what's going on, but yeah. that's not necessarily what's really going on. And that, that is all about diving into that specific individual and talking about their true 80%. Right. And the rest is the less important stuff. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the goals of this series is to kind of demystify some of the terminology and acronyms and things that different industries have. I wonder if you can give us some kind of 
some of the lingo that goes on in the, the real estate business, either just in real estate itself, or maybe even more specific to real estate investing, if you want to go that way, just to give people a flavor for the kind of language that gets thrown around and what it means. Uh, some of the some of the lingo uh, that is thrown out there, uh, for example, uh, because I focus a lot on investors, we talk about ROI, so return on investment, and that essentially is. I'll give it, um, so you put in $100,000 and uh, as a down payment, okay, on a house. And then after all expenses are paid for, you're left with uh, $100 or, or let's just say uh, $10,000 a year left in, in, your, in, your, in your pocket. That's $10,000 of cash flow. So that's another term. Uh, but then there's, your mortgage that gets paid down. So let's just say that gets paid down another $10,000. And let's just say the market appreciated by another $10,000. So that's in total $30,000 that was sort of given back to you. Right. So if you've put in $100,000 and $30,000 was given back to you, then your ROI was 30%. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's year, well, in an in individual year. So I, I suppose right. from, the, from an investment perspective, you're thinking five years or 10 years kind right. of timelines, right? Right. That, that was an annual return on investment. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's ROI. Is that a typical return on investment or that's just a simple example? <laughs> that was a simple example. Just <laughs> that was a simple example. Yeah. Uh, cash flow is another one. Um, that is essentially, uh, if you're renting out uh, an apartment, a condo or a house, and after paying off your mortgage, after paying off your property taxes, insurance, and all your expenses, and if you're left with positive money, like some money in your, in your pocket, that means you have positive cash flow per month. And uh, that's a good thing. Yeah. So that's, that's the term cash flow. Uh, one other one is bully offers. I actually like that one. Uh, so a bully. So a bully is someone that, you know, pushes you around, tries to get their way in, 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 in the schoolyard or in anywhere in life. But in, in real estate, <laughs> where, where? In the office. <laughs> yes, in the office, it happens. Yeah. Um, so a bully in, in real estate is in this heated market that we're in, Sellers sometimes decide to put their house up on the, on the market for sale. And then they say, okay, we don't want to look at any offers until one week from now. And the purpose of that is to get a lot of activity, a lot of interest. And then on the offer date to get a big bidding war and then get the inflated price that they were hoping to get. Now, in between that week, within that week, if someone decides, like a buyer decides, you know what, I'm not going to wait until next week. I'm going to bully that person, that seller, and I'm going to put in a bully offer. So a bully offer is essentially submitting an offer before the actual scheduled offer date. Okay. So that's what bully offers are. And the purpose of them is that that buyer is trying to get in before everyone else to hopefully get the property maybe below what they would maybe be willing to pay for on offer date. Yeah. And if that seller accepts it. That means they were probably not even expecting that much yeah. on offer date. Now, is the bully so, offer usually like a certain range above listing? No, there, it it all depends on um, what that what the what they believe the market value is. It, yeah. Okay. The list price is truly a marketing price. It could be a hundred thousand dollars below actual market value. It could be five hundred thousand dollars below. Yeah. It could be ten thousand dollars below. It's it all depends on how the uh, how they've listed it. Right. Interesting. So and and how, what's your experience with bully offers? Like, do they, does it work or is it usually just piss the, the, the seller off or how does that usually play out? I'm curious. I, I actually, before our interview here, I made a call to, uh, as representing the buyer, trying to make a bully offer. Okay. Uh, but the, the, the seller's agent said, we're not looking at, we're not, 
looking at any bully offers. So the seller specifically instructed their agent to say, we're not considering any bully offers, which means they are only waiting till the offer date. Yeah. Uh, but that was, that's just one example. There are many examples where bully offers are welcomed. So yes, they do work for yeah. a lot of times. Okay. Interesting. Hmm. Such a, well, an another, another, uh, interesting term. This is not, you know, this is, I guess, real estate lingo, but in offers when we're writing in what's included in the purchase price. Yeah. Uh, one term that we use is elves. Oh yeah. <laughs> so elves, it's it's not the little elves that are in the North Pole, but they're elves. It's spelled E L F S. Uh, it stands for el electric light fixtures. Okay. So it, we're we're basically saying the offer that all the electric light fixtures in the house are included in this purchase. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people say elves. What, yeah. what do you mean elves? Well, yeah. What kind of place? What's in the attic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So those are just some of the lingo uh, terminologies that are thrown out that I can think of right now. Yeah. Cool. In terms of the industry as a whole, I mean, everyone's got different ways of measuring success. And you know, probably within the industry, there's there's uh, industry metrics around days on market or um, inventory oh, yeah. things like that. As an agent yourself, whether you want to talk about it as a realtor or as an investor, maybe some of the the key performance indicators you look at. You mentioned ROI before, but uh, in cash flow, but are there other measurements that you use either to measure your own success or or just the the success of an investment property in itself? I'll talk about success measured as a real estate agent, and then I can touch on the success measured uh, for an actual real estate investment property. Okay. As an agent, this is probably the topic that I get frustrated about quite often. And people ask, so, you know, how many sales did you make this year? And so if I answer one, yeah. I'm, the, I'm a very poor performing agent, but they don't know that that one was that $20 million bridal path house that netted me or grossed me a commission of whatever five hundred thousand dollars yeah i don't think but unfortunately and but if i say i i sold 20 but there are 20 leases and they don't know that yeah uh oh 20 well that's a lot yeah you did well but meanwhile they're all leases so i actually grossed ten thousand dollars this year uh so quantity is it means nothing but unfortunately it's it's uh it's celebrated. It's, it's, Oh, you, you get awards for this. Yeah. And every brokerage or every company, real estate company, whether it's Remax, Century 21, Keller Williams, uh, any other company, we all have, uh, awards like, you know, you're a platinum club member or you're a hundred percent club or you're an executive member or the diamond award winner. Yeah. That all means, you know, you've, you've surpassed a certain commission. Now you could, you can measure that as success, but if I earned five hundred thousand dollars in one year in gross commissions, does that mean I was successful? Yeah. Um, in my opinion, absolutely not. But a lot of perception is, yes, that person's successful. But how much did they actually spend that year? Did they spend five hundred thousand as well? So that means they have zero savings, or did they spend seven hundred thousand and they're negative two hundred thousand now? Yeah. Or they spend a hundred thousand and they actually save four hundred thousand dollars. So when it comes to real estate agents and measuring success, I believe that it comes down to how did you how did you do when it came to setting your own goals? You know, what goals did you set for yourself? Did you did you did you pass them? Did you meet them? And are those goals actually your goals? Did you actually set the right goals for yourself yeah so this is my version of how do you how to measure success and so again uh it's, it's just my way of um of thinking i, I don't i don't think it's um, it's right or wrong but i i don't think that measuring success by how much commission you made is the right way right right it's funny because it, what's popping in my head is it, kind of related to 
what I'm trying to do in my coaching practice, which is, you know, uh, my, our, my mentor always talks about coaching as a relationship business. And, and, you know, I think of real estate very much the same way. It's a relationship business. So like success versus quantity of, of homes sold or bought or um, commission earned or whatever. It's, it's, you know, more like relationships um, made or, um, you know, thriving relationships with people like, you know, that are, you, you, you know, lots of agents can get a lot of volume and they, but they're not making any friends per se, like relationships is kind of low on their, their list. But, you know, when you play this integral role for a family or an individual on their biggest investment of their life, and it's a good, you know, you help them through the trials and tribulations of that. And like it's, it can, can be quite meaningful for people to have a good, uh, I mean, that, that's, to me, that's the value of a, a good realtor is, is a relationship and, and taking them through that journey. Yep. Yeah. And I know, is. you know, you're, you're, you're a, an upstanding gentleman. So I know you're, uh, you know, for those who, who maybe don't know Andre, like Andre hosted a, Christmas, virtual Christmas party, basically for all of his clients and friends. And it was, uh, had a, ma a magician. Um, I forget the, the gentleman's name, but he was, he's quite a, a famous magician that I saw. I remember seeing him on the Penn and Teller show, but it, it was like probably the most fun virtual experience that I've ever had was that Christmas party. And it was, you know, that was just Andre giving back to his client base. So it's, uh, it's good, you know, kudos to Andre for building those relationships. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, relationships are key. Um, and that's without even thinking about it. Um, you know, that's, that could be one way of measuring success. And, and maybe that's a bad way of saying, Hey, cause I have more friends. I'm more successful. That's not true. I, I'm trying to say the, the quality of relationships that you establish I think are going to take you a lot farther in life than the amount of commission that you're earning this year. Yeah. Uh, it's not a matter of how many people are in your database, although people measure success on how many people did you call today? Yeah. 150, 20, how many quality conversations did you have today? That's my opinion on what's more successful than how many people did you call today? Yeah. So you can have 10,000 people in your database and I can have a hundred and I can, I can technically be more successful than you because I, I know those people very well. They know me very well. They trust, there's a trusting relationship there and we thoroughly enjoy each other's company professionally and personally. Right. It kind of segues into the next, next question about the top skills required to be successful in your industry, uh, you know, relationship building, we just touched on what, what other skills are there? I believe you have to be motivated. I don't know if that you know like self-motivated, definitely self-motivated because you are technically your own boss. Right. So you're not going into work nine to five every day. You don't have to punch in, punch out. You don't have to take an hour of lunch. Um, you don't have a manager and then a director and then a VP and then the CEO and then so forth. You don't have to ask for vacation and you don't have to ask to take days off. So when you have that sort of flexibility, it's really difficult to stay self-motivated. Mm. Like you are tempted to just sleep in. You're tempted to go to bed whenever you want. You're tempted to just sit and watch TV. Hey, what? Especially during this pandemic. Yeah. Imagine that. Like you have to stay home. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, where's the fridge? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, I, I know, I, I don't want to sound like it's, it's um, I'm trying to make things a little odd here, but it's true. It's very difficult to stay self-motivated. So that's one skill that you definitely should have. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to having relationships, of course, being a people person, um, you know, being able to listen to people and communicate with them uh, clearly and professionally is so key because, you know, with, with, uh, with these devices nowadays, um, it, everything is done electronically. And if you do not know how to communicate electronically, uh, things could get uh, misunderstood and relayed incorrectly. 
especially with autocorrect, you say right. something, <laughs> you say the absolute opposite and you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, so that's where you need the unsend button. Unsend, unsend. <laughs> I know. And, and one thing that actually uh, I believe is very important when it comes to listening is one of the most um, influential people that you and I, I guess, think uh, in, um, are inspired by is Stephen Covey. Yeah. And one of his rules is um, seek first to understand, then be understood. Yeah. Is that correct? Is that one of his uh, rules? Habit five. Habit five. Uh, I believe if, if, if you're with in, in front of a client, whether they are a seller or a buyer, don't just assume you know what they want or you know what's right for them. Truly listen to them. Try to understand them. Put yourself in their shoes. And it's that simple, but it's it's actually harder than it sounds. Yeah. And when you uh, say that, because I, I I mean, for those who don't know on the call, I had a stint as a realtor myself in 2008. And I found when I was showing people properties and they're asking your opinion, like, what do you think or whatever? And you're like, well, this may or may not be a, a house that I would ever buy or the, you know, it, and I found it difficult to kind of like separate your own opinion of what you would buy or why you would buy it or what you'd be willing to spend or the neighborhood or whatever, because it's really like you're, you're representing the client is, you know, so you really have to understand, like you said, what is it that the client needs and wants and likes? And it's got nothing to do with you um, as a realtor. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this is a skill, but it's, it's something that I, I think is very important. <clears throat> and it kind of uh, talk, it, it's filling the gap, like, like, like your whole theme is here. So one thing I believe is very important in this industry, I realized very, very early on. So when I was 27 years old is when I first started. At that young age, I asked myself, why would anyone, and I'm brand new to this industry, why yeah. would anyone choose me or use me and hire me to help them buy their most expensive and largest investment that they'll ever make in their life? Who am I? Why would someone use me? Yeah. And that the same, same applies to your, your theme filling in uh, experience, uh, filling gap of experience. Well, how do you get that experience? Like you have to get it somehow. How I found it to be uh, beneficial for me is I actually got my experience by buying my first three properties before I became a real estate agent. Mm. So that helped because I actually walked the talk and people knew that about me and I've already been doing it for three years prior to actually becoming my uh, a real estate agent right so by me having that experience i was able to help other people as well yeah so how do you how, how do you so maybe you go buy your own home first maybe you go rent your own home first maybe you buy an investment property first maybe you you shadow someone or you work with someone first prior to saying, hey, you know what, let me just, um, can you be my guinea pig? Uh, I just want to just, you know, yeah. try myself, my, just start, start off on you, Greg. You know, yeah. want to sell your house with me? Yeah. So interesting. Maybe uh, one thing that occurred to me when you're talking about um, being self motivated and being your own boss, I'm, I'm not sure people really, understand kind of the business structure within the industry in terms of the broker and the agents that work with that broker that it's, you know, I remember when I joined the industry, it's, it was like a complete reversal of the normal job interview process because, you know, you're going to meet brokers, but they're really, you're interviewing them to go work for them versus them interviewing you like as if you're an employee. Um, and then all your colleagues are your colleagues as well as your competitors. So I don't know if you can maybe explain that a little bit and what that's been like uh, for you. Yeah, when I first uh, was looking for a brokerage, I interviewed three different brokerages, Keller Williams, Century 21 and Remax. I ended up choosing Remax, uh, primarily because the agent that I was using, who I really enjoyed using was in that brokerage. Uh, so when you're, when you're going there, 
people, yes, uh, I guess it is the exact opposite of you going looking for a job. You as an agent are now interviewing the broker of record or the owner to see, okay, hey, you know, why should I work with or for them? Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to see what their training, uh, what tr- what training they offer. Uh, do they have any sort of special training or do they offer leads? Do they uh, offer f- office space, boardrooms? Uh, what, what's the benefit of you joining them? Because essentially part of your commission is going to go to to them. Right. And when you need help, who, who do you have access to? So there's a lot of discount brokerages who are all virtual, who have no space and their fees are very low, but you have no place to go. You have no one to really call. You have no support system. You are truly alone. Right. Um, so you, you, you want to, so there are, yeah. And then the, the colleagues, so that broker of record, you might, you might be interviewing says, yeah, well, we have 250 agents in our office. You know, you have all of them for support. You have, you know, do I really, or, or, or am I going to be up against them? Yeah. Cause, cause unless you are part of a real team, meaning you are truly splitting your commission 50, 50 with someone or, or a certain split with someone you are working together as a team, yeah. everyone else, all the other agents are essentially, I don't want to say your competitors, but Hey, you're, you're all going for that one seller. Yeah. You know, you know, you're not going to say, okay, you know what? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Have them. You have them this time. I'll take the next guy next time. Yeah. Because there's over 50,000 agents in the GTA, yeah. you know, who's, you know, there's too many of them. Yeah. And in all honesty, it's too easy to get your license nowadays. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's an interesting stat that uh, I read and it was, so this interesting stat that I read was from the Toronto Real Estate Board 2020, the year 2020 statistics. The number of registered agents was 58,000. Wow. 20,000 of those agents did zero deals in 2020. Wow. 25, close to 26,000 of those agents did between one and five deals. So that, that alone is... 46,000 agents out of the 58 did between zero and five deals, essentially. Yeah. 6,600 agents did between six and 10 deals. 2,600 agents did between 11 and 15 deals. Almost 1,800 agents did between 16 and 25 deals. 791 agents did between 26 and 50 deals. 163 agents did between 51 and 84 deals and hundred agents did 85 plus deals. Hmm. So 80% at least of the agents out there did essentially nothing. Yeah. So that tells me that there's 80%, 80% of the agents out there, they, they're either doing this part-time or they're not, they shouldn't even have their license. They're maybe carrying their license yeah. and 15 percent of the deal uh, of the agents out there are doing majority of the uh of the deals yeah. all the other deals it's funny you say that and kind of related back to like why would somebody hire me comment well, like when i left people asked me all the time oh why didn't you keep your license and do it part-time and i'd say well i wouldn't hire somebody who was doing it part-time so how would i have the the balls to, to ask somebody to hire me if i wasn't doing it full-time so yeah. that, that was kind of my own way of thinking about it was that if I wouldn't hire myself, why would I expect anyone else to hire me? <laughs> yeah. And it's not cheap. I mean, it's, that's the other thing people don't realize between uh, all the fees you have to pay for. I don't, maybe you can talk about that too, a little bit about this. It's kind of like, um, I think of it as a, kind of a mirror of like the way the government set up with federal, provincial, municipal governments. It's like the real estate industry is kind of set up in a similar way. Yeah, there's, uh, there's several fees involved. I don't know the 100% what all of them are to give you an exact number, but I yeah. do remember when I hired my licensed assistant, sorry, my assistant first, then I uh, paid to get her licensed. Right. And I remember it cost me, in one year, it, it cost me, I think, $6,600 for 
for her to get her license. Yeah. And it meant that she wasn't even doing any deals. Like she was just a, a licensed assistant. Yeah. So if you were to do nothing, it would probably cost you around that, that amount. Yeah. Just to kind of have your license. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's not, it's not cheap. And then, and then every deal that you do, I guess there's, there's a, a portion of your commission that goes towards that. Um, and then there's also your marketing and a whole other whack of stuff yeah. that you start paying for. Yeah. You pay to go to work, by the way. Yeah. And I think that's another thing people don't, I don't want to say they don't care, but they don't really realize that, you know, you're, you don't earn a salary. Like your, your entire hundred percent of what you earn is based on closing deals. Yeah. Right. That's so great. it's, uh, anyway, I don't want to bore people with my sob story of <laughs> all my failed deals <laughs> where you end up working for free. But, uh, anyway, um, if somebody's thinking about getting into the industry, I mean, you already alluded to like sh shadowing people or learning about stuff, um, investing, what, what, what is your best advice you would give somebody who's thinking about getting into real estate, either as a, as a realtor or as an investor? As both, I would say the number one advice that I have is hire a coach and that, that's the best thing I ever did. And I did it three years after I started my, my first real coach. Now, I don't mean a coach, meaning your broker of record or your owner is, you know, helping you by, you know, meeting up with you once a month or once every two weeks, just to see how things are going. That I'm not talking about that type of coach. I'm talking about you hiring a coach, paying the money. They are not emotionally or financially invested uh, in your outcomes. So right. I, I believe the coach has to be uh, arm's length. They have to like be uh, non and non invest in whatever your outcomes are. <clears throat> so you have to be careful because there's a lot of great coaches out there, but there's many, many, many more unqualified coaches out there. Mm. So I've, I've hired in my career, I think at least five coaches, they were all very different. Um, you know, you're coaching Greg. Yeah. So when someone, like, I remember when we were at Loblaws, you changed, you, you were a huge influence. Like you brought our department together weekly, I believe it was, and you indirectly were coaching us. But it's like nothing I've ever seen before. When you go in a corporation or the corporate world, people are like, yeah, so did you get that TPS report done? It's like, it's like hold on. No, Greg Fisher brought us together and he started opening us up. He started asking us questions that were more personal based, not work related. You know, so what do you enjoy doing? What's your favorite foods? What's your favorite song? What, what is the thing that you love most about doing? He was seeking to understand first and then see what motivates us and for us to actually be more productive and actually enjoy our jobs. That's what I got out of you, Greg. Yeah. You were phenomenal at coaching us. Thank so you. I applaud you for that. Uh, some other coaches that I've worked with, um, some great ones, uh, Philip McKernan, uh, Oliver Menelis, Ben Osterveld. Um, so those are a few that uh, I would, say that were big influences on, on, on myself. I actually went to, my first coach was in 2009. I, I hired them. I interviewed six coaches and I, for some reason, I hired this guy, his name was Philip McCurney. And I was like, there's other coaches that are charging $35,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And Philip McCurney was not at $35,000 a year at that point. I was like, hmm. That person that's charging $35,000 a year, she actually coached Olympians and stuff like that. I was like, this girl can probably get me to the top of the world yeah. on top of the podium. That's where, you know, I was like sort of promised that I'd be. And I was like, why wouldn't I hire her? Well, for one thing, $35,000 a year was probably out, a little bit out of my budget. Yeah. That's the main reason. But there was also another part that pulled me towards this, this gentleman, Philip, who... 
I said to him, he, he, he said to me, what do you want to get out of this? When we're done in one year, what do you want to get out of this? I was like, okay, so I want to get 35 properties. I, I hired him to help me as an investor, not as an agent. Yeah. And throughout the coaching, the first six months of coaching, he said to me, he goes, Andre, I'm still not understanding why in the world you want 35 properties. It does not make sense. And I'm seriously trying to understand it from your point of view. He goes, I don't think you need help in that, in that, in that category of your life. Yeah. I think you need help right here. Yeah. And he goes, you're doing fine as an agent. You're doing fine. If not, you're actually pushing yourself. You're going to get sick if you keep pushing and trying to get all these properties. What are you doing? And I'm, 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 I'm putting it in the Coles Notes version. This is sure. like six months down the road. Yeah. And that was the moment that things just turned around for me. I went from owning, I think it was 11 properties uh, to selling them down to owning only three. That was the moment that I started focusing on my real estate agent business more than my investing business. That's when things turned around and I started working on myself, the inside, inside out. Yeah. It, that, that was the time that I, I, I started learning more about myself, who I am, how I respond to things, what were, what were things that were holding me back. It was not, it was not, Hey, how do I learn to become a people person? How do I learn to listen, like listening skills, interpersonal skills? Nothing to do with that, Greg. Yeah. And it's so hard to describe what you learn with certain coaches. But this one particular coach, Philip, he just, he, he's one of a kind. And he brought out, he saw, right? He sees through your soul. And just, anyways, it's, um, uh, Hiring a coach is what I believe was the number one thing I did for myself. Yeah. And I believe it will hold you accountable. I believe it will help guide you in the right direction. Because if, you, if, you, if you're going in one direction, but it's the wrong direction, how are you ever going to know, you know that you need to sort of shift? Yeah. Maybe you need some guidance. And, uh, but remember, not every coach is the right coach. So you have to find the right coach, interview them. And if you don't know who the right coach is, sometimes you need to figure that out. Maybe get someone to help you find who the right coach is. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's my number one best advice for someone starting off or not even starting off, even someone who's well, well advanced in this, in this business. Yeah. Yeah. And just in general, I mean, it's, it's not specific to the real estate business either, right? Just in life. Yeah. It's very good. Um, yeah, I appreciate everything you said about, I mean, this is why I've gotten into coaching is because truthfully, like I've been coaching people for 20 years, just I never would have necessarily called it that, but uh, that was um, a big part of what I did in my career. And probably the part of my career that gave me the most personal fulfillment. So that's, uh, that's why I'm actively pursuing that right now. So, so and that, that's what I like about you is that, you know, you're good. I don't want to say that's the only way, you know, you're a good coach, but you know, you're a good coach because you love it. Mm -hmm. You thoroughly love doing that. And that brought you joy. That brought you life whenever you were coaching me or yeah. our, our colleagues, our, our employees, like you were doing such a great job. And, it's a lot and, more fun than selling cereal. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But, but like, I'm sure you know this too, Greg, there's a lot of co coaches out there that are just not in, 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 in the right business. Yeah. And that's the, that, that, that statement I just made applies for any, any career. Like there's, agents out there who are in this business that shouldn't be in this business and the same applies for any other industry out there. yeah yeah for sure for sure well i think a lot of the statistics you went over in terms of uh percentage of people that are successful or you know that, that's a kind of a microcosm of, of that whole statement that you know 50 percent of people in most businesses probably have no business being in that business but they're just there for 
whatever, however it is they got there. But, you know, that's, that's part of people's life and journey and finding where you fit and what, where your passions lie. So, um, seeing that we're just coming out of the pandemic and I mean, you mentioned it that, you know, during lockdowns, like it's, you know, being a realtor, you're out in the market, you're looking at properties and all of a sudden, boom, everything shut down. Is there anything that's come out of the pandemic in terms of new ways of doing business that is like a breakthrough? Like the, the example I use a lot that I enjoyed and I hope sticks around is like dealing with the doctor's office, right? Like now I don't have to go and sit in a waiting room for 45 minutes, then go in and whatever, like I can phone the doctor, leave a voicemail or send them a text or send them a picture of like, you know, a cut on my finger and they can tell me, you know, what I need to do. Um, and it's just saves so, so much time, like requisitions or email. So I know the, since I was in the real estate industry, when everything was like faxes and paper, I know there's been a lot of stuff, even pre pandemic that's, that's elect, become electronic. Um, was there anything specific you can think of in the pandemic that you hope sticks around? Yes. Um, a lot of things have become virtual. So uh, time has become much more efficient uh, and I've been more productive. So before when we used to put together offers, I did not do virtual offers until the pandemic started because I felt like that human connection was more relevant and more important. So I would go drive to my client's house I would prepare everything for them. We would sign everything, fill out everything. And then I would go present the offer or I'd go to my office, fax it or scan it through. But normally I would present it in person. Now, I don't have to drive to, for example, Durham. Or I don't have to drive to Peel or Mississauga or, or North or in the, and fight through traffic just to have someone sign an offer. Yeah. I just email it to them. And within minutes, it's back to me fully signed. Um, that is, you want to call, want to talk about time efficiency? Like that's brilliant. Yeah. But it was always there for us before that, but we just chose not to use it. Other, other efficiencies was virtual showings. You know, whenever I have a, a lease up for, 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 for rent, a house up for, for rent, I, I didn't do this before and I don't know why because it's such a great idea but I, I now create a, a walkthrough video of the of the of the apartment thoroughly and I talk about it and now I upload them to YouTube and when someone inquires about the property I send them that walkthrough video I send them the floor plans I send them the features I send them all the information I say after you view this if you still are interested let me know and then we'll go book a show yeah at least 90% of the people say, oh, I didn't realize X, Y, Z. Oh, I didn't realize this, or it was a basement. I didn't realize it was that short or that small or that large or that old. Yeah. And I just saved myself hours upon hours, not wasting my time to show that person at that apartment. Yeah. So I'm talking like, whew, amazing, like, like time, time saving. Yeah. But I have to say, I, I don't believe, and that still, even, even to your comment on, you know, having doctors virtually and stuff like that, the human touch, I believe, will always be relevant, will always be needed. Being belly to belly with someone is always going to be preferred versus yeah. over the screen, like what we're doing right now. Yeah. Like if I was beside you right now, I'd tap you on the shoulder, I'd give you like a nice yeah. big hug. Yeah. But like, it's different. And I, are we going to be able to sell things virtually? I have not many, but I have, but you still need to show the place. They still need to walk in, smell that air in that house. Yeah. Smell it, feel it, look around. How does it make, how does it make you feel seeing those cathedral ceilings, yeah. seeing those big windows, the stained glass windows or smelling that air? Did you, like, is it stale? Is it fresh? Is it new? Is that fresh painted smell? Is that, is that carpet smell? Is that hardwood smell? Is that cedar yeah. smell? You need to go in there and feel it because that's how people buy houses. They feel them. Yeah. And 
It's not just, hmm, let me click here. Yeah, let me choose that leather, that steering wheel, that type of tires. No, it, houses are not like that, especially the resale houses. Brand new houses, okay, fine. Maybe you can pick and choose your, your ingredients there, but yeah. it's so different. Sure. And yes, the, I, I believe this is a temporary thing, but I believe the efficiencies that we've developed through this pandemic will still be continued. At least I hope they will, like a lot of virtual tours and, yeah. and maybe even virtual signings. Those are, I think, very efficient. Yeah. But when it comes to buying and selling, you have to, I still feel like you need to go there physically, feel the property, make sure it feels right inside you. Yeah. That, that decision. That's good advice. I just, I'm curious, like, what is your, your favorite or best real estate or real estate investing story? Like the one that when you think about it, it just re invigorates your passion for what it is that you do. Like, is there one experience or story that, that pops to mind that you'd like to share? The one that lingered in my mind right now, when you were just saying this is I'll, I'll name you, I'll, I'll say two of them. One, the one that was the, the, the main thing that came into my mind is I have, uh, I, again, I work with several uh, investors uh, and this one investor that I'm referring to, she was my client uh, from 2007, I believe. She purchased with me about seven properties, investment properties in Toronto. It, 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 within a time frame of about three years. Mm. And in within five or seven years from when we first met, her and I had a sit down and chatted. And she was she was a bit stressed out. She's like, Andre, you know, I don't know if I, I kind of want to like leave my job. I I don't know what to do. Like I I don't know if I, I if I'll have enough money to do this or what. Like she was just stressing out for for, for financial reasons. Right. And then we, we I sat down with her. I said, "Look, here is what you currently own. Okay, property one through seven. You bought it for this. It's worth this now." We went through all of them, and I looked up at her. I said, "Do you understand? This is." your net worth is $7 million right now. Mm. And this has nothing to do with your savings or anything else. Just with these properties right now, if you were to sell them today, you would have $7 million. Yeah. This is within five or seven years after she started doing this. So that moment right there made me so happy. I was like, she was stressing out for financial reasons. And then I just, she's put, a millionaire. <laughs> she's a multimillionaire. She's, and, and, and I helped her get there. And, and I, I, I'm not patting myself on the shoulder or anything, but yeah. that made me feel good that I was able to help investors buy properly with the right strategy and achieve a net worth that they couldn't even imagine when they first started. Yeah. And that's just one of the stories. Yeah. Uh, the other story that just happened recently was during the pandemic. I have a client who bought an investment property in March of 2020, 2020, when, when the pandemic literally just started. Yeah, 2020, yeah. And he was like, oh, crap, Andre. Like, I don't even know what to do. Like, um, like his wife just got laid off. He was like, okay, I'm not laid off, but uh, we're having a hard time qualifying for this property because of the, my wife just got laid off. So yeah. I have to go with a B lender, which is a, a little bit higher interest rate and not that great terms. So we'll only go with this B lender for one year and then we'll refinance next year. Yeah. We'll go with hopefully an A lender, if everything goes well. They bought this property. One, one year later, which happened just a few months ago, they refinanced. So meaning they were trying to go with a better lender at better terms, meaning a lower interest rate. They got it reappraised at four hundred and fifty thousand dollars more than what they bought it for, and they didn't do a single damn thing to the house. Yeah. 
And this was an investment property, meaning they just made $450,000 for doing nothing but having the balls, the courage to go and buy during a pandemic. Yeah. Risk reward right there. Uh, That was like, I was even saying, I wish I I bought it with you. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, those are moments that make me uh, realize that uh, helping others and seeing the achievement of others is is the reward itself. It makes me happy. It makes me want to get up in the morning and do more of this stuff. And uh, it makes me happy because I am, they're not just a, a client, they're a friend that we talk, we hang out. Um, you know, our families know each other. So it's, it's one of those things that just makes everything just come together and click and makes it all right. It's awesome. Well, just, I mean, it's a great example of the possibilities in real estate, right? Like where else can you make almost half a million dollars in one year? Not too many places. No, but uh, one thing I do know is that when when people do hear about that story, they'll say, oh, I, I want, I, I'll, I'll sign up. Yeah. But they don't have the courage to pull the trigger and take action. Yeah. They're like, oh, but can't I just, you know, can't I just buy something, you know, like, like they're looking for unrealistic yeah. things. Whereas the, the reality is, is that, hey, when everyone was backing off in March of last year, these people stepped up to the plate. Yeah. Mind you, it was probably not their intention. They didn't really know what they were getting into because everything was up in the air. No one really knew what was going on. Yeah. But still, they had the courage to do so. Yeah. And, and could have it burned them in the end? Maybe. But again, they weren't doing this for the short term anyway. Yeah. Most investors that I work with are long-term investors. They do this for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So if there are any ups and downs through the, throughout the way, which there will be, uh, they're not directly impacted. Yeah. yeah. So the, uh, Andre, the next question is about, uh, do you have examples of industry specific interview questions um, that you use when hiring in your industry or when people are hiring agents? Just curious what you, what you find in, in terms of interview questions. I, I do have um, experience with hiring uh, licensed assistants or e- even um, just unlicensed assistants. What I typically ask them are three questions, and that's in my job description. So when I, sorry, in my ad, uh, when I have an ad out for a job position, I ask them this. So at first I say, if you want an interview, you will not get an interview if you do not answer these questions below. So when people just send me a resume yeah. and just apply that, that way but with not answering, I don't even look at it because that means they didn't even read my description, my, jo- my job description. Yeah. And my three questions are this, why did you apply for this job? That's my, fr- that's probably the most important question. Why did you apply for this job? Yeah. Is it because you're desperate, you need money. You need, like, why did you apply for it? Yeah. And that will tell me, probably 80 to 90% of what I need to know. Yeah. Second question is, please review our website. For my sake, it was my website. Like some people might say, please review our company policy yeah. or company. I say, please review our website, beachinvesting.com and tell us how you feel about being part of this company. Yeah. And then the third question we ask is, why do you like working in the field of, in, of, of real estate? And out of when I was looking for an assistant, literally if I got a hundred to 200 inquiries, maybe a handful of them answered those questions. Yeah. Made my job a lot easier. I was able to just, no, 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 no. Oh, there's someone who answered them. Yeah. And some of the answers were not what I wanted, but some of them, like the odd one or two were like, okay, so now I'm actually excited to speak to this person. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I got that this idea from another coach of mine, Ben Osterveld. Yeah. He um, gave me these uh, sort of ideas. 
I also got some great ideas in, uh, from your videos that you do, Greg, because you have a course uh, that, that teaches this uh, on yeah. this topic, preparing for interview questions. Yeah. So I, I find that the, all of these to be good preparation. But if you're on the opposite end, if you're the interviewer, then yeah. you need to know sort of some ideas and maybe some strategies on how to, how yeah. to, how to best approach it. Yeah. One uh, last thing I wanted to give you an opportunity to plug your book, because I, I know you, you, you have a book that you promote on your website and I think through Amazon. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to talk about your book a little bit, because I, I know it's a lot of time and effort goes into creating such a thing. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my book, One and Done. It, uh, you can find it on Amazon or you can find it on my website, beachinvesting.com. You can download it uh, from my website. It is free on my website. On Amazon, there is a fee to it. Um, it talks about in order to achieve financial freedom, all you need is one investment property, one and you're done, the right one. And um, in that book, I explain how it all works, what you need. I do create a lot of videos as well. And these videos are all educational. They, um, they're not sales uh, videos. And, and this by all means, if I wanted to make money off this, I would charge more money, but it's not about that. It's about me trying to share in my experience, my clients experiences, uh, to help educate others to, to, to do the same or to find what works for them. Uh, there's no one answer to, that will meet all, all people's needs. There's, there's uh, millions of different answers of how things can work. Uh, I find that this works well for me and many of my clients. Um, it's simple, but it does require some courage. It does require work. People believe that, hey, you know what? I don't want to do work. Well, then, you know, this is not for you. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's uh, that's one thing I have learned is, it, you know, every, everything in life, if, if, if there's um, a reward at the end, it's going to it's going to take some work. You know, we're not looking to win the lottery. We are trying to achieve a financial uh, a financial goal. And primarily it's to either secure our family nest egg or it's to have our children um, financially better off in the future. But it's also to establish some sort of generational wealth that we can pass on to our next generation yeah. and to live comfortably and not have to rely on a company pension or on your director uh, maybe letting you go and because you did not perform well or because you you cannot come into work because of some undue consequences with your family yeah. health or something you you want to take control of your own financial uh, finances and by doing so i believe you will do well in the financial world you know everything else your health your wealth your your well-being you have to own up to that Hire a coach will help guide you to get there. So anything that you do, whether it's buying a property or hiring a coach or finding a job, finding the right one is, is, is the right way to do it. And how do you find the right job? How do you find the right career path? How do you find the right property? That's the, that's the million dollar question. Yeah. But surround yourself with the right people, get the conversation going, speak to people such as Greg, uh, who will guide you uh, maybe in the right step forward. Well, this has been an awesome experience with you. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Me too. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise and sharing it with the world. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it very much as well. All right. Thanks, Andre. Thank you. Bye, everyone.